candidates for dominating the news this week. They must try a successful Germany tonight. My guests with them and John Young, the Warren South Vietnam and the Civil Rights Watch and Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. On the surface, these stories seem to be unrelated. Yet somehow they are all related to man's limitations, his frustrations and confusions which have plagued the human race for centuries. The Germany plan was a spectacular success, and yet it could speak dramatically of man's limitation in space. The science tell us that there is now no limit to what a space as far as they know. Yet Gus Grissom and John Young have stayed in the Mighty Brown, traveling at 18,000 miles an hour, and headed straight for the nearest star. It would have taken them more than a hundred years to reach it. Even if man someday does get to Mars, which would require a space trip of several months, he still will not have left his own solar system. In spite of all the successes of Russian cosmonauts and the American astronauts this past week, man is still Earthbound. Some think the name Job said, why must the heart of man's bounds? Man cannot pass. Meanwhile, there's an ominous silence on the part of the North Vietnamese and the Chinese in Southeast Asia. There are some reports of a massive Chinese buildup, and that China herself may be getting ready to enter the war. On Cyprus, it seems that the fighting is going to break out again, and we could have war this summer between Greece and Turkey. Thus, man's age-old problem of war and conflict plagues the 20th century even more than any other century of history. James 4.1 says, How once the wars and fightings among you, come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? At the same time, the headlines of the newspapers and many hours on television tell of the civil rights struggle in Alabama. They frame another of man's problems and frustrations. Both Negroes and whites in Alabama are struggling to find the meaning of all that is happening. The Negroes are frustrated because they feel that all rights of citizens have been denied. On the other hand, the white people of Alabama are bewildered by the suddenness of a gigantic social revolution that is descending upon them. Selma has become only a symbol of a worldwide problem that plagues the entire human race. Where are the two races lived side by side? There is nearly always trouble and friction. The problem on Cyprus that threatens to break out into war is between two nationalities, the Greeks and the Turks. And this is true almost all over the world. Recently, when Prime Minister Great Britain spoke at the banquet of the Lord Mayor London, he quoted this fact, and God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. He did so to fortify this repudiation of racial enmity in Great Britain. Think of it, Great Britain of all places. The very fact that he devoted part of such an important speech to the matter of racism indicated that he was disturbed about this great problem even in Great Britain. All over the world, there are racial incidents. It has led one of the presidents of the World Council of Churches to predict the possibility of a race war within the next 25 years. In Alabama, both races have become symbols of this worldwide struggle. This problem is not limited to Alabama or to the southern part of the United States. This problem is not limited to Holland. This problem is not limited to certain sections of London or to South Africa. This is a global problem. Wherever two races are living side by side, the Bible teaches that there is a unity of the human race. We are all descendants of Adam and Eve. And as to the one, the Apostle Paul said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. In other words, we are all descendants from a common prayer, and we are all sinners, not only because of our own individual sins, but because we've inherited the tendency to sin from our great ancestor Adam. The old man was a sinner. The white man is a sinner. The Negro is a sinner. We have all sinned in the sight of God, and we all need the forgiveness of God. Further, 
ready to ascend and ascend the prayer comes to preach also the grounds of man for aggregation of natural brotherhood by accumulating and the human race but the art of sin the art of the moral disease of sin in the heart of men of all nations nations nationalities and even families they are angry bitter hate and lust and greed so the history is one long funeral for brawls because man has not met his moral obligation to his blood brothers there is only one place where we can possibly find any lasting understanding to the problems of the world whether they be in South Vietnam Great Britain Cyprus or Alabama and that is the good cross of Jesus Christ the scripture says in the second chapter of Ephesians for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments contained in ordinances that to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity therein as we stand at the cross we see that there is a basis of true world brotherhood there is a great deal of false talk today about the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man most of the appeals which are made in the name of peace today are based on the idea of brotherhood and there is the sense in which God is the father of us all by creation however the Bible also teaches that God sees only two classes of men the saved and the lost those who are going to heaven and those who are going to hell his fatherhood belongs spiritually to those who have been regenerated to those who are trusting him Jesus made this plain in John 8 44 when he said ye are of your father the devil thereby asserting that some people have chosen to reject God as their father apart from the work of the cross in the world today there is bitterness intolerance sedition ill will lust prejudice greed and hatred but within the circle of the cross there can be there is the possibility of love and fellowship and the possibility of a new brotherhood the only hope for world peace or for racial peace for that matter lies at the cross of Christ where all men of every nationality and race can become brothers this is an American newspaper editor said there are two things that will never be solved the problems of race and war I say these and all other problems could be solved can be solved but it will never cross the cross of Jesus Christ it's not only the basis of our peace and hope but it is the means of our eternal salvation the cross offers not only a freedom from pardon but a transformed life in fellowship with God no wonder Paul said 2,000 years ago we preach Christ crucified but what on earth was there you saw it on ten national and racial discord but he stood in the midst of city after city of the ancient Roman world made up of many races and preached Christ saying him crucified is the answer to the problems of their day and the same message is what the world needs today this is the message of hope and peace and brotherhood this is what the world calls Christmas but this God has been pleased to call wisdom when the Apostle Paul went to the great intellectual city of Corinth he said for in the prayer not in anything of only said Jesus Christ and him crucified when Paul was asked what his message was he always replied we preach Christ crucified to the people of Corinth the preaching of the cross was foolish nonsense even moronic and idiotic but Paul said the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men in that great city of Corinth the cross of Christ was a stumbling block to the children of Israel and to the Gentiles it was sheer idiocy the intellectual Corinthians demanded a system of philosophy they wanted something their minds could grasp the scripture says that the natural man cannot understand the things of God the fourth cross has any meaning at all the spirit of God must try to divine the scripture teaches that our minds are covered by a veil which is the result of our separation from God he 
Jason Sakon of the United States Senate for four term holds the former head of the Hebrew Society and a memorable voice of youth for some time in Hollywood. He participated in this university's second Senate Civil Rights Offices in the Hebrew religion. He was a part of a unique history of deciphering the Bible for scientific reforms of religion in our society and stressing that religious and moral values must not be ignored if our society is to remain free. One of the most devastating things in recent history has been the pressure to exclude God and religion and religious values from our moral and public life. To be sure, as the nation we're deeply committed to the principle of pluralism, but some in the name of pluralism have used it. And it seems that Hollis religion by suppressing any religious influence in our society thus for example as recent surveys have made clear textbooks often mention little or nothing about the role of religion played in the founding of our nation by its founding on our society many have in fact been completely sanitized of any reference to religion but this is a serious distortion of our history and in the end of this secularizing trend could lead eventually to social and moral chaos. In a recent book entitled Religion in American Public Life, Dr. James Murphy, senior fellow of the Brookings Institute, concludes that the single most influential social force in American history has been religion. He further says almost all the founders of the United States, including Jefferson, were convinced that the head of the Republican government depends on moral values derived from religion. Their conviction was correct. Almost every major American social movement, including the civil rights movement of our century and the secular groups of religion from the 19th century, were directly influenced by the evangelical revivals which sought liberation from the oppressive Roman law. I want to finish this as an example. By 1861, 66 colleges and universities had been established in the South which still survive. Over 30 of them were established with the Roman law, and the rest were established by the churches. The churches of South Carolina supported the establishment of this university with the universities of college of South Carolina. At least two of them referenced in the 19th century that not only that God Woodrow would internationally recognize two religions, Dr. Woodrow was the uncle of Woodrow Wilson and had a strong influence on the future of the university. And he saw this Christian conviction not of one moral law but many, favoring the colleges with public education, which one historian has termed the most important contribution to education ever made by an educator in this state. Chapel was convinced, by the way, in those early decades to push compulsory rather than try to exclude God from public life as well as its law to try and have some religious balance. Groups attended large gatherings on God and seek to live in accordance with his will for our society. But as again, peace and moral and spiritual truths on which our nation is based to this new generation of young people. To try and find out what's really required to play in this chess and it does, it's most effective when it is concentrates on this one little card that you are playing the gospel. Here's an article in this week's Newsweek magazine that all of us ought to read. Four of the evangelicals are the people who have claimed the gospel from the Bible. Going so fast and some of the others are falling by the wayside. To try to follow the gospel from any text. Well, let's look at that, for example. Many of you attended Christmas worship this morning for religious education. But the primary mission of the church to the world is to proclaim the unchanging gospel of Jesus Christ to a lone and changed human mind. This we do both in our lives and ministry and the words we speak. Last July in Amsterdam, we had 8,000 evangelists from 100
Relax, make do. And the same is for my students here today. Among the rich, the poor, the young, and the old. Businessmen who have a certain amount of money go through what I call swallowing and burning syndrome. They are not allowed to talk. Which day? with the gentleman from Maryland, and Martin Brown Barnes, said, if I had a personal faith on a number of things, I wouldn't have been a true believer. And I have seldom seen you get in a moment of breaking news, say with equal conviction, that if indeed was true. But when I become a student writer, it became a different old man. I have a son who even if he were a true old man, it would kill me. The words we hear have mentioned that the good old sin may end, but not with so merry he went on to admit to saying, not too soon. When he was a baby, my little toddler mother was deeply concerned. She saw an error in my answer to pray with her, and she gave John a Bible to read. When many in the ministry and the believe in God heard that a Christian prayed, they refused, saying that it was not there. I had a friend who was reading Egyptian war lords in the north of China. On a flight out from Shanghai, he told me that when he read the New Testament twice, he would feel that difficult to make the poor man a believer. In the weeks that followed, he was laid up in a difficult military situation. In desperation, he called on the Christian God of whom he'd been reading and told God that he would believe it. And his wife's prayer, he would publicly confess on the spot later. Through the late Bob Marr, he did make a public confession of his faith in Christ and was baptized in 1993. His subsequent life of quiet devotion to Christ was a demonstration of the reality of his faith. A short while before his death, Henry Newman was being served in the dining church of the old slave in Taiwan. He was too weak to attend. He asked the pastor to bring the bread and the wine so that the devil could see Dr. Communion there in his room just a few days before his death. Secondly, things which are quiet type. He never used to attract notice or let folks see him and his big appearances in Taiwan, nor did he exploit political attitudes towards international negotiations. In his former political career, he never meant to in Egypt, but when he testified to his Christian convictions in God, his witness for Christ was clear. Almost immediately upon his arrival in Taiwan, he ran to a small chapel close by his home. Christian worship was observed there every Sunday. He invited members of his government staff and a full of guests occasionally to worship with him. But this was never publicized in Paris. Instead, it was a place of sincere worship by the generous and all knowing John and the head of it. Thirdly, his was an unashamed faith. For a number of years after moving to Taiwan, he was not accustomed to go on nationwide radio every Christmas Eve to give a message on the significance of the birth of Jesus Christ. Friends of mine who had heard him would make the point that while the vogue of preaching at Christmas celebrated the coming of the Son of God to earth and had thought he must have really delivered this sermon in his private chapel for friends and associates who gathered there. One of my old friends in Hongkong said of Ephesians, he said that the journalist and all gave superb messages on the meaning of the cross of Christ. We Christian missionaries should love the young man in Taiwan. The lives of our people and the draw of the determination to them. As a result of this, the Christian churches in Taiwan have increased 2,000% in number. In fact, Taiwan has some of the most dynamic, fastest growing churches in the world. One of the most important decisions that he made concerning Christianity was in 1951. Leaders of the Pacific Testament League, an American organization roots in the War of World War I, had understood from New Testament to military personnel that to do battle could have been his office. The Ministry to Commission could have ceded Bibles to his army. He would 
Today, we do not say goodbye to President John Marshall or his aides. We say au revoir till we meet again. We are down to three of the greater legends of this past week. One bridge in the eye of the other in London, where over 10,000 Baptist delegates are attending the Baptist World Alliance. The Geneva Conference is now over. Thousands of weary people are now lining up and moving out. This past week will be recorded in history as one of the most important weeks in this decade. To those of us that have been on the scene here in Geneva, it has been a week filled with excitement, anticipation, surprises, disappointments, and fears. Geneva has been bulging ever since with every hotel and private room and town occupied. This is the height of the tourist season, and with the added attraction of the big third, you can hardly breathe for the lights of Dolomites, Nizzi Hanging, and Sightseers. Some newspaper people have actually slept away in the railroad station. Others have slept in the parks, and some have not slept at all. Temples have on occasion been shut, but by and large, this conference has gone along as smoothly as can be expected with so many people and so many problems. The two main attractions here have been the premiere of Russia and President Eisenhower. Eisenhower is from our in Europe, and every year over there makes a good job. Some of this historic conference has accomplished anything that will leave your ultimate peace in this cold war. Only history can say one thing is certain, that he has communicates have not told the world the full story. Only time will tell. Many people are honestly, particularly those here in Europe. And we're like mad Americans, on the other hand, that are cynical, lest America has once again been led into a trap. There is another thing that is certain, and that is that the basic issues of the world today have not even been discussed in this conference. I have repeatedly said, and I strongly believe that our greatest problem is not bombs, war machines, or political philosophers. The most formidable threat to the peace and security of the world at this hour is human nature. The biggest question is not the German question, the Formosa question, the European question, or even the Russian question. The big enigma is the human question. When we begin to cope with this mysterious, unpredictable force called human nature, we are dealing with a far more potent in politics, more devastating than war, more powerful than the armed might of a nation, and more destructive than the Black Plague. I say this after years of thought, study, observation, travel, and prayer. As sorrows may be improved, laws may be amended, revolutions may take place, and great movements may be organized. These are all to the good, but at least the outward laws are replaced by inner attitudes and little is actually gained. Signed armistice between nations do not in themselves bring the people concerned one step nearer personal or inner peace than the whole world is longing for. Jesus Christ was not primarily concerned with political revolution because he knew that a change in government did not mean a change of heart. George Lansbury of England said in his eulogy, as I look back across my life, I see that I have not been unsuccessful. But if I had to do over again, I think I would give my whole life to the changing of men, for without all change, nothing can be changed. Human nature is capable of rising to the highest heights or sinking to the lowest depths. Give an unreliable, degenerate man a stick of dynamite, and he will blow up his neighbor's house or car safe. The old man who has been converted by the power of Christ to stick of dynamite, and he will tear a piece of land and make a garden. Give a rich man who is driven by an army his selfishness, a gun, and he will use it to hold up a bank or shoot his enemy. Give a man the gun by the power of Christ a gun, and he will shoot some game and invite his neighbors over for dinner. Weapons in themselves are not harmful, only as they are placed into the hands of designing, degenerate human beings do they become harmful. A few years ago, there lived in Germany two men. One was named Adolf Hitler, and the other Albert Schweitzer. Both of them possessed gifts and talents which might have been used to benefit mankind. Hitler, driven by ambition and the lust for power, used his talent to steal the secrets of the world, leaving a bloody trail of political greed and murder and bloodshed. Albert Schweitzer, seeing that he could be a central force of action, used his talents to bring healing to a benighted people. He turned a dark jungle into a sunlit paradise, and he did it by God's power in Jesus' name. Our world is more uneasy than it has been in a generation, even though we are living in a time period of so-called peace. Our greatest loss is not only 
things, nine times, the height of power. These are sinners' things. Uh, we also lost this confidence in men. And we've lost confidence in men because men have sucked his faith in God. Out of the human nature is out of the kingdom of God. He brings us to our successes, seeing only the Messiah favors. And then he realizes taking place in the Western world. In the midst of the greatest ceremony of goodness, the three warriors stand from the middle and model the question. This model the question is causing men turned successful to lay their own lives by the thousands. We don't know by several years how much signs were everything material within their grasp had reached to the close in dialogue by the sleeping tablets that ended all. Solomon, wise in the fate of his human nature, once said, even laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that no ways remains. So as we look into the wide outfit of this thing called human nature, we see here falling the common obstacle power without alloys, success without satisfaction, and prosperity without peace. Could it not be admitted that we feel that it's so often laid around in the marches of futility? Tell me a king who dares to stir our doubts as he quietly comments that when I lie well in my God, I have in my hand an old book called the Bible. It is not true because it is old, but it is old because it is true. Here is what it says about human nature. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I realize that modern psychology tries to exonerate man of his depravity and sin. They say that we all are born with a tendency towards self-centeredness. But can we blame all the murder, the assault, the robbery, slander, thievery, and cruelty of the race on a moral tendency towards self-centeredness? I think not. Human nature has seething within it a violent, hideous, beastly, passionate quality called sin. It is this trait, this fault in our natures that gives decent people the capacity to be indecent. This favorable men to turn into disrespectable men. Reliable persons to become unreliable. Sober men to become drunkards. Virtuous men to become unvirtuous. And good men to degenerate into beasts. The Bible declares that sin is universal. Who can say, says the Bible, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin. Every one of them is an old bag. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. The Bible again says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This clay, this disease of man, sin is universal. It is found in men of every race, color, and creed. Sin is not French, German, Chinese, Japanese, Russian, or American. It knows no virtual window of national bounds. This disease has infected the human family universally. So as the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So consequently, man's effort to cure himself of this moral disease has failed to penetrate this universal thread. Science has done wonderful things for many serious diseases. They have found cures for diphtheria, tuberculosis, certain forms of cancer. And now we make them around the serum for polio. But man has failed to create a serum for sin. The unmistakable symptoms are found in the heart of every one of us. Pride, deceit, evil imaginations, greed, selfishness, lust, and hatred. What can be done about human nature? It is this sin in human nature that causes all the juvenile delinquency in America. It causes all the crime in America. It causes all the problems in the world. It causes all the difficulties that bring about communism, Nazism, and fascism. It is sin within the kingdom of God. How can we cope with it? How can we find an answer to this disease of sin? Is there any hope for the world? Or do we let it go on fighting generation after generation until we destroy ourselves? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to tell you that there is a great hope. I am called to proclaim that something has been done about this greatest of all world problems. Cures are being afforded by the hour. A solving for the sin of man has been discovered. Healers need no more finding new help. They needed men of discovering no guilty, dishonored men that have found a new buoyance in joy. In prison, men have found a way out. 
things possible
Everything related to you make me smile I know you are doing hard work to make things possible I want to let you know that I am with you And I will be forever Every little thing related to you make me smile I know you are doing Things possible. I want to let you know that I am with you and I will be forever. When you talk, I want to listen to you for hours. When you are there beside me, I feel like looking at you all the time. My love for you never really change Just want to tell you that you mean a lot to me Every little thing related to you make me smile I know you are doing hard work to make things possible
bao đêm đợi chờ mưa rơi lòng cháy với như xưa biển khơi cánh chim bé nhau tung bay người đầu hay ta không oan trời bao năm tình yêu chưa phai giờ chia hai đôi lứa lạc nhau lối gió số phận đã không an bài